invite you to turn to a neighbor and say this to them. The peace of the Lord be with you. Well, we've been talking about boldness for the last uh, five or six weeks now and, and seen a variety of shapes and forms and people demonstrating great boldness. And we want to continue that this morning as we think about this theme that the righteous will be as bold as a lion. And this morning I want to jump into the New Testament. We've been exclusively in the Old so far. Uh, actually, we started in the New, but I want to jump back to the New Testament and to the early church in Acts 4. And uh, just at the end of Acts 4, it starts telling us about some of the incredible boldness and unity that we see in the early church. It says this, All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them that there was no needy one among them. For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. So we see this great boldness, this great unity in the early church. And I love it says that uh, they didn't feel like any of their possessions were their own. There was no needy person among them. Hey, is that your new Lamborghini? It sure is. Want to take it for a spin? Is that your RV? My RV is your RV. Happy camping. Off you go. There's this great unity where they just share everything. And there's no needy person among them at all because whatever they have is shared among them. Does that sound appealing to anyone here? Kind of. Right? I mean, I think it's fair to say that we do not have that kind of unity. We just don't. We instead have this kind of Western mentality of, that's kind of my stuff right? Like that, that's mine. And so when we buy something, we'll put our name on it or we'll insure it or we'll write down the serial number. This, this actually belongs to me. And that's how we end up in this world where all of us have, say, a bicycle, even though we only ride it for about 15 minutes a year. Or we all have a set of golf clubs, but we haven't used them since Happy Gilmore won the Masters. I mean, we all have these things, a lawnmower, even though I only have two feet of lawn I have to mow. And we we all have that because we don't want to have to depend on someone else. We like to think that we're self-sufficient, self-reliant. We don't like asking for a favor, ask, going to the neighbor's house again and saying, excuse me, can I borrow your, whatever, your ladder? No, instead we all have a ladder that we've never been up before because we hire someone to come and do those tall things for us. We have this sense of, I don't want to borrow, and we also have a bit of a sense of, if I lend it to them, I think they'll break it. Right? If I give it to them, am I ever going to get it back? Will it be ruined? And so most of us do not experience a lot of shared unity. We don't share our possessions because we're a little bit concerned about them. There's, of course, exceptions. Um, I borrow lots of stuff. In fact, I borrow a strange amount of stuff from Grant McMaster, and he has a strange supply of a bit of anything. So if you ever need something, phone him, tell him that I sent you, and then I get a bit of a referral fee, and that will work out just really great for all of us. But he could tell you I've borrowed things and broken them. I was thinking of that just, uh, just earlier this week. I borrowed his power washer. I broke it. He said, don't worry, I have two. Right? Isn't that strange? Why would anyone have two power washers? But that's kind of the Western world, right? We have multiples of things, and we don't want to borrow because we don't want to look needy, and we don't want to lend it out because it might get broken. Early Christians had this incredible um, unity among them. They were boldly faithful. Boldly faithful, trusting God that if I lend this out and it gets broken, I'll be okay. If I share this and don't have enough for myself, it's going to be okay. I trust that God will provide for me, either directly through himself or through his people, right? There was just this bold, bold faithfulness that allowed them to live that way. It's one thing to lend out your lawnmower or your car or your ladder, but here's something that demonstrates that bold, bold faithfulness that they had, is it tells us that some of them, when a need arose, some of them would sell their house or sell their property and just bring all the money and lay it at the apostles' feet. Use this money however you wish. 
That's kind of next level to lending something out, isn't it? I mean, some questions come to mind, like, where did they live after they sold their house? Did they move in with someone else? Did they join the unemployment line? Were they at the homeless shelter? What happens then? But some of them do that. They sell their possessions, sell their house, sell their property, sell their land, and give all of the money to the apostles. Do whatever you want with this money. That's boldly faithful, I think. That is a bold, bold faithfulness. And we have a generous church. Uh, I want you to hear me say that you are generous, faithful people in your giving. In fact, during COVID, and I think I've shared this before, our giving has remained so consistent the whole year and a half of COVID. It's phenomenal. When we made our budget last year, we're like, okay, well, giving is going to go down by this much. We have to cut programs back by this much. We actually didn't need to do that because your faithfulness has been so, so consistent in your giving. So thank you for that. What hasn't happened this year is I don't, no one has come to my office and said to me, Pastor Ian, we just sold our house in Cloverdale. Here's a bag with 1.5 million in it. Bam! Do whatever you want with it. I would build a pool because the one across the street is too far to walk to. So I'd put a pool right in the courtyard maybe. I, have, I mean, we have boldly faithful people, but I've never, I've never heard of that kind of just generosity, bold faithfulness like that, where people say, you know what, here's all of it. It's pretty inspiring, and it was inspiring in the early church. People just saying, I can't, I can't believe it. There's no needy person, no hungry person, no person going without. Why? Because we're providing for one another with whatever God has blessed us with. He hasn't just blessed me, he's blessed all of us, and we're going to share what we have. I want to read what happens next in this story. Jumping into Acts 5 now. Now a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has filled your heart that you've lied to the Holy Spirit? And have kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land. Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You've not lied just to human beings, but to God. Here's a couple that want to be boldly faithful, or at least they want the credit for being boldly faithful. And so they do something boldly faithful, just like uh, all these other people before them, almost. They sell their property, bring it to the apostles and say, we sold the property, here's all the money. Except they're lying. Except they've kept some back for themselves. Whose land was it? Theirs. So whose money was it? Theirs. That's what uh, Peter says to him here. The land before it was yours and the money was yours. You could have done anything you wanted with that. If you had bills to pay, if you had expenses to cover, you got a sick dog that has to go to the vet, you could have taken some of that money, paid for it. Every, that would be totally fine. The problem isn't that they kept some of the money. The money was all theirs. The problem is they lie about it. They wanted to appear boldly faithful, but their process in trying to do that was badly flawed. You know what we'll do? We'll just keep a little bit of the money. We'll tell them we're bringing all the money. We sold our Cloverdale town, uh, a teardown for $1.5 million. We'll never believe that. Let's bring them a million. We'll keep half a mil ski for ourselves. We'll get the swimming pool we always wanted. No one will be that any wiser, right? They, have this, they come up with this plan with the wife's full knowledge. They work on this plan together. This is what they do. Peter says, what are you doing? You didn't just lie to me. You've lied to the Holy Spirit. There's a, a lot of different things kind of at play in there. But I think that, kind of to boil it down, they wanted to appear boldly faithful, but the truth is they were badly flawed. Badly flawed in their thinking. Badly flawed in their motivation. Badly flawed in their process of like, oh, if we just keep a little bit of money, no one will ever know. Is that a new Harley Davidson? Oh, I've, this old thing. I've always had this. Are you sure? I've been to your house before. Always, always had it. Always had that new Harley just badly, badly flawed. This week, I'm sure that you have all heard over the past uh, 10 days or so about the children's remains that were found in Kamloops, 250 uh, remains of children in an unmarked grave, and it's uh, horrifying, right? I mean, we, I think we knew about that before. Most of us had heard about that. We know from the 
truth and reconciliation documents and all those things that we knew that there were these graves out there. But the discovery of it and the uh, numbers contained in that grave has kind of just brought to mind again this kind of wave of, oh my goodness, that's just so terrible. And, and it's terrible and it's tragic. And so we hear all these boldly faithful comments, big, bold comments of, how could that have happened? That would never happen today. The church is evil. We need to just get rid of it. Tax them to the ground. Uh, these people were so terrible. They were monsters. I mean, we're seeing all these big, big, bold headlines. But I wonder this. I wonder, are there things we're doing today that people will look at in 100 years or 50 years and say, that's horrifying. How could they ever have thought that was right? Because one of the things that's true about residential schools is the government agreed to it and the Catholic Church agreed to it and society as a whole must have been somewhat okay with it or thought, well, I think, think that's probably the right decision because Canadians went along with this plan of the residential schools. And it's a reminder that governments can be wrong and the church can be wrong and people, the people as a whole can be wrong. Is it possible we're doing things today that in the future will be viewed as just as horrendous and terrible as what happened. Every year, 85,000 babies are aborted in Canada. 85,000 every single year. At some point, well, people look back and say, that's horrifying. Why was that happening? Because almost all of those are needless. If you don't want to be pregnant, you don't have to be pregnant. I mean, there's uh, the pill, and there's condoms, and there's other things you could do, and there's this wild thing called abstinence that I've heard is very, very, very effective. I mean, if you don't want to become pregnant, you don't have to be pregnant. And yet, 85,000 times a year, someone gets pregnant and says, we have to just end this right now. And so 85,000 babies every year are killed. Today, today, 700 million people will go to bed hungry. 700 million people and they went to bed hungry last night and they went to bed hungry the night before that and they went to bed hungry the night before that and they'll go to bed hungry a week from now and a month from now and a year from now when's the last time you saw that in the news 700 million hungry people every single day never why because i ate really well last night and you probably did too I think just about everyone in Canada ate really well, and so it doesn't seem like it's our problem. Well, where are those people anyway? Right now, last night, there was around 80 million people living in refugee camps who've been forcibly removed from their homes. They have nowhere to live, so they're in these camps, 80 million or so. Around 30 million of those are children. 30 million, that's the population of Canada. Children living in refugee camps every single day. Some of them will spend their entire lives there. They'll never know anything different. See that in the news last night? No. I mean, these are kind of great big things that we just don't ever, ever hear about, and yet they're happening today. Every day, more and more people are taken into slavery in the world. That number goes up every single year. Every year, more and more people are trafficked humans, mostly women and children, being trafficked for horrendous and terrible things. Are they going to look back in 50 years and say, how could they have let this happen? This year, governments around the world have spent hundreds of billions of dollars, probably, well, trillions of dollars, actually. For a fraction of that, we, we could have fed everybody. We'd find a place for everybody to live. I mean, we could address these things if they were an urgent issue for us. But they're not. I don't say any of that to discount residential schools. Horrifying, terrible. The worst thing about residential schools is that God's name was associated with the whole thing. How could that have ever happened? But is it possible in the future people will look at us and say, how could they have ever let that happen? Are we boldly faithful or are we badly flawed? The truth is we're both. We're both. I am badly flawed inside of me. You are, you're badly flawed. You guys at home, you are badly flawed. 
which is why our bold faithfulness is so important. I don't have the answer to all those problems. I don't even begin to think I could scratch the surface of solving all of those problems, past, present, future. But I do know this, it starts with Jesus. Not just a flawed statement saying, oh, I, I believe in Jesus, or I know Jesus, or I think this about Jesus, but boldly acting in the name of Jesus. Not random things, not things that are my agenda, but I'm just putting the stamp of Jesus on them, but actually moving forward in his word saying, Jesus said this, so I'm going to do this. I know that I'm badly flawed because I can know all those statistics, and most nights I never ever think about one of those hundreds of millions of people who are hungry. I can scrape our leftovers into the garbage and never think, oh man, I've got so much, and some other people have so little. I, I almost never think, man, we should adopt another world vision child or compassion child, or we should donate more to this or tithe more to that. And it's because I'm badly, badly flawed. So I know that it starts with Jesus, and I know that it starts with going to Jesus and saying, I confess. I confess that I am badly flawed, and I need you, Jesus, to be my Savior. To confess that most of these issues don't bother me because they don't impact me, which means who's the main God in my life? It's me. And as long as I'm at peace, as long as I'm content, as long as I'm happy, then everything else in the world, well, it doesn't really matter what's going on because I'm feeling pretty good today. Sun's up, I've got a pretty good tan, I'm out on my kayak, paddling on the water. What could be better in the world? Is there anything wrong in the world at all? Yes. There's people in need. There's Christians in need. There's people in this church in need. I want to read for you what happens next in the story of Ananias and Sapphira. It says this. When Ananias heard this, I'll just reread that last sentence. You've not lied just to human beings, but to God. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died, and great fear seized all who had heard what had happened. Then some young men came forward, wrapped up his body, and carried him out and buried him. About three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. Peter asked her, Tell me, is this the price you and Ananias got for the land? Yes, she said, this is the price. Peter said to, you, to her, How could you conspire to test the Spirit of the Lord? Listen, the feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out also. At that moment, she fell down at his feet and died. Then the young men came in, and finding her dead, carried her out, and buried her beside her husband. Great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. Great fear seizes them. Why? Because they lied and they died. Just by a quick show of hands, any of you ever lied before? If you don't put up your hand, I think you're lying. (laughs) Great fear seizes them. What happened? They lied. Then what happened? They dropped dead. No way! I mean, could you imagine just the terror that would sweep through the church? Make sure you don't lie. Don't lie about anything. I I don't know how how this unfolds, but this one lie kills these two people. Lots of commentators say, how could this have happened? Why would they drop dead on the spot? And they think, well, maybe, maybe this was the first sin in the early church, and it just rocked all of them. That seems like a bit of a stretch, because I know that all those people in the early church were deeply flawed just like all of us are. I know that the leaders of the residential school, that they were deeply flawed. Ananias and Sapphira were deeply flawed. The people in the early church were deeply flawed. You and I are deeply flawed. We're both. We're boldly faithful and deeply flawed. We have to kind of live in that balance, that reality of both things. Remember the words that Jesus said? This was in uh, Matthew 22. He said this, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. That's what we're called to, church. We're called to go and do that boldly. White, black, black brown, yellow, whatever your skin color might be, young and old, rich and poor, close by and far away. We're, we're called to love all people everywhere. Why? Because of how much Christ loved us first. We love because he first loved us. How did he love us? Just with reckless abandon. That Jesus comes to us, lives, dies, rises again. Jesus comes to us where we're his enemies, we're told, and dies. And that's his plan. I'll go and give my life for these people. Why? Because I love them. Because I've chosen them. Because they need me. 
And so Jesus comes and gives himself to us even while we're deeply, deeply flawed. And because of that incredible love that he demonstrates for us, we can then go out and be boldly faithful. We can share with our neighbors. We can share with our church community. We can take up a cause and say, because of Jesus, I want to bring light into the darkness. I want to bring hope to those who are hopeless. I, I want to look at the issues of the past and say, we need to find a way to, uh, to address this, to try and bring healing, to try and bring reconciliation. But at the same time, I also want to look at issues today and say, what are we doing today that's flawed and wrong? And maybe it's things that the church and the government and society is going along with. How do we bring light and hope and Jesus to these situations. And then to think of the future, what can I do today with my children? What should I be teaching them? What should I be educating them to know about, preparing them for, so that when these things continue to change, they'll know the truth, and they'll have hope for the future. What should we be doing? Well, we should be doing whatever we can. We should bring light and hope and, and giving to all those things that God puts on our hearts. We should be writing to our MPs and to our MLAs and to the Prime Minister, not because we're activists, but because we're Christian. And so God has sent us to be a voice for the voiceless and to use our privilege, whatever that looks like. Maybe it's because you're wealthy or maybe because of your job or maybe it's because you're just so good looking. Whatever it is, whatever advantages you have to use those for other people, not to rescue them, but because Jesus has saved you. And my bold faith should line up with my actions. Otherwise, there's this breakdown. Just like Ananias and Sapphira say, yeah, we want to be boldly faithful, but we do want to lie a little bit about it. Right? I mean, isn't that so often how we're motivated? I want to appear this way, even though I'm actually a little bit more like this. Instead, we want our bold faith to line up with bold actions because we've got this Jesus, this God who lived and died and rose again for us. I don't know all the answers, but I know that it starts with confessing to Jesus and saying, Jesus, I need you. I need you because sometimes I think that I'm so good that I don't need you. I need you because I know that in my past there's a trail of wreckage because of the flawed decisions, choices, thoughts, words, things that I've done. And I need you today because even though I'm trying to cling to you, sometimes I forget Sometimes I let go. Sometimes I cling to the wrong things. Sometimes I attack at the wrong times. And I'll continue to need you. And then I sells the house and brings the money to Peter. Remember Peter as a disciple? Um, this is the same Peter, Peter the disciple, Peter the apostle, same guy. Do you remember Peter as a disciple? Deeply, deeply flawed, right? I mean, he was the guy who always was like, pick me, pick me, pick me. What's your answer? Eh, wrong again, Peter, right? Or he's the one who was always saying things like, Jesus, you'll never die. We'll never let that happen. And Jesus was like, get behind me, Satan. You're so off base here, Peter. Or Peter was the one saying, Jesus, if you die, I'm dying with you. And then he's the one who's like running faster than everyone else. I'm out of here because here they come to arrest him. I mean, Peter's deeply, deeply flawed. Peter's the one who says, I don't know him. Jesus, never heard of him. I'm sure you were that guy. I don't know anybody named Jesus. Never heard of the man before. I mean, Peter's deeply, deeply flawed. And yet through the power of the Holy Spirit, Peter is preaching in the streets and he's leading the church and he's standing here in the power of the Holy Spirit knowing that someone's telling a lie. We may be badly flawed, but we can also be boldly faithful. And through Jesus, somehow, we can walk more and more in step with the Holy Spirit in truth, in peace, in grace, in unity, and look more and more like him. Church, my hope and my prayer for us is that we would live more and more like Jesus and we would love more and more like Jesus and we'd open our arms more and more like Jesus and we'd live sacrificially more and more like Jesus and that the world as it looks at us would say, Man, I don't know if I understand that, but I do know this, that Christians are loving people. Are we boldly faithful or badly flawed? The truth is we're both, which is why we so desperately need to keep clinging to Jesus. In his name, amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for today, and we give you thanks that even though we're deeply flawed, even though we're broken by sin, that you love us so much. 
Lord, we give you thanks that it's not up to us to earn your attention, to win your grace, to discover your favor, but that you poured it out for us before we were ever born, before we'd ever heard of you. We give you thanks that you, in your great wisdom, came to earth to rescue people who were your enemies, who were different than you, who were flawed, even though you were perfect. And Lord, this week we uh, have been reminded again of how devastating the trail of sin that we leave behind can be. We've been reminded again that it's not just the past, but it continues to impact the future, generation after generation. So Lord, we pray that you would pour out grace on those who are hurting. Lord, we pray that the that the process that unfolds to try and bring um, discovery and comfort and healing and reconciliation, we pray that all those things would be led by you because we know if we lead them, they'll just be flawed and broken again and they'll just be more hurt along the way. Lord, we pray for, um, for the church. We pray that the church would cling so closely to you that if at any place that we err, that we'd err on the side of love. Lord, we pray that you'd guide us by your Holy Spirit as you've promised to do. Help us to hear him. Help us to be led by him. Help us to be in step with him. Lord, we confess to you that we were broken. We see it in our own lives. And Lord, we know it's not just someone else's problem that sin impacts all of us and there's no escaping it except by running to your arms, being covered in your blood, being covered in your robe of righteousness. And so, Lord, we pray for that today. Lord, we pray that we would go out boldly, that we wouldn't be afraid to claim your name, that we wouldn't be afraid to say that we're part of um, your kingdom, your family, your church that we would be bold in doing that and that we'd be bold in sharing forgiveness and extending grace and admitting our failures because we know that the goal isn't to point to ourselves or to point to our leaders or pastors, but it's all to point to you and to bring you glory. Lord, we pray for all those situations that we've talked about today. We pray for survivors and families of residential schools. We pray for those who go to bed hungry every single night We pray for those who are in refugee camps. We pray for those who are facing a pregnancy and who are considering an abortion. We pray for those who are being trafficked. We pray for those who are living in slavery. Lord, we pray that you would use us to break these cycles of sin and despair and greed and hopelessness and evil. Lord, build us up, strengthen us, and send us out into the world to represent you. And Lord, for everything else in our hearts and minds today, Lord, we just ask that you would cover it with grace. In Jesus' name, we ask it as, he pr- as we pray the prayer that he taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And deliver us, patient, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Church, I want to ask you two questions. The first one is this Do you believe that you are deeply, badly flawed and in need of a Savior? If so, answer, I do. And do you believe that Jesus has in fact lived, died, and risen again to set you free from the power of sin and give you eternal life? If so, answer, I do. Then it's my privilege to tell you that your sins are forgiven and you can go living forgiven and free as his children loved beyond measure and sent into the world to bring life and truth and hope in Jesus' name. I want to close with one final song.